But it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our MC of the evening, a little belated, a man who has been around almost as long as most of you out there, a man of great talent, creativity, and a very imposing presence who has used these qualities not only in furthering his career, but in, has given them freely and generously to many causes. I give you William Marshall. Well, here I am, your imposing presence. <laughs> it's been a long swim, but I'm very glad to be here. I want to move on very quickly because there's a great deal to do yet. There's a great deal to share with you that I think you'll be most pleased about. Uh, we want to acknowledge the presence of some very essential, wonderful human beings. We're talking about Judge Martha Golden. We want to <laughs> We're talking about Judge Paul Cohen. Judge Cohen. And Judge Harry Schaefer. Judge Schaefer. And there's well, there are a lot more people, but there's one, one name here in particular. Cohen. Isabel Cohen, not Paul. <laughs> there do be a difference. Now, I'm having trouble with this next name. It's in very, very small print. If I can read it. Uh, he is going to probably say a thing or two later. I'm making it out slowly, and it says, Ed Asner. <laughs> he just shook his wicked eyes at me. <laughs> and with us this evening are several previous honorees of the Southern California Library, longtime civil liberties and labor attorneys. Ben Margolis. <laughs> and one John McTurnan. <laughs> also present are three representatives of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. They are celebrating their 55th anniversary. So please welcome Steve Nelson, National Commander of the Vets and Veterans for Bill Wheeler, Mr. Bill Wheeler and Norman Perlman. I think at least uh, three or four of you out there will remember that war and the great Generalissimo Franco <laughs> and his great strides toward uh, further making fascism work. <laughs> yes, he's gone now. <laughs> Nature and time can be a great help. We welcome past president and vice president of the library who have come from Santa Fe to be with us. <laughs> Bill and Dorothy Doyle. <laughs> 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 
And welcome to Sharon Delugach. Did I say that correctly? Somewhere near. Executive Director of LA Jobs with Peace. And to Catherine O'Neill, head of the Citizens Committee for Public Transportation, which spearheaded the drive to keep jobs in Los Angeles by moving for a consideration of the Sumitomo, 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 Sumitomo contract. God's sake. Finally, we welcome a group of distinguished historians and encourage them to use the library more often. <laughs> now, in this second page here, it says, William Marshall, brief remarks. <laughs> now, Mayor Ken Geyser, um, I'm going to go ahead with this introduction because I'm not sure whether he has been on or not. He hasn't, has he? Thank you. Mayor Ken Geyser of Santa Monica was scheduled to be with us tonight, but unfortunately has become ill and we wish him a rapid recovery. We are fortunate to have with us, however, speaking for the city of Santa Monica, one of our old and dear friends he is known for the progressive law practice he maintained for years, the important work he performed on the local rent control board and city council, and the compassion he brings to his current post on the Santa Monica Municipal Court. Please welcome Judge David Finkel. <laughs> Judge David Finkel. Good evening, folks. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to move on now and introduce the gentleman who quite possibly has come a long way to be here with us. That is to say, he was born in Scotland, raised in Ireland, educated in Oxford, that's a hell of a distance already. Um, Alexander Coburn has managed to ruffle feathers all over the world. Um, Mr. Coburn is a contributor to such diverse publications as The Nation, well, that certainly ruffles feathers. The Los Angeles Times, more feathers. New York Review and Harper's, feathers, feathers. He contributes a regular column to In These Times. Hmm, <laughs> feathers, feathers, feathers. He knows our library well and has devoted a column to the Times, in the library, to the library, rather. He comes from a family of troublemakers. Well, need I say more? He immediately enters into our hearts, doesn't he? A family of troublemakers. Who can say they didn't have such origins? No one here. <laughs> no one here. He's published a, a collection of his own work, Corruption of Empire, and several others. His latest work, Encounters with the Sphinx, Journey of a Radical in Changing Times, will be published by Verso Press in the spring. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexander Coburn.
Alexander Coburn, how can you speak so irreverently about our, our, uh, our? <laughs> I, I asked the question, so I'll answer it exquisitely. That's how you would do it, and how you did do it. <laughs> Thank you. I got a hold in of that rock, don't you see? I got a home in of that rock, don't you see? Between earth and sky, thought I heard my savior cry. You got a home in of that rock, don't you see? When I used to hear, When I used to hear the great, never to be forgotten man, Paul Robeson, he always, <laughs> he always ended that song by saying, yes, I got a home in that rock. It's the rock of peace. It's the rock of peace. I had a number of very fine conversations with Mr. Robeson a number of years ago in New York when he was under virtual house arrest. The government was sitting on his passport, you know about that. And uh, he was living in Harlem for the first time, really, and lived there with his brother, his older brother, who was the, the pastor of the Mother Zion Church, the AME Mother Zion. And Mr. Robeson sang, sang in that church every Sunday. But he never sang a solo. He sang in the choir. And uh, I thought that was kind of fascinating. But he talked a great deal about a man whom he thought was our greatest teacher. Our greatest teacher. And his name, Frederick Douglass. I'm going to share a brief poem by Robert E. Hayden about Frederick Douglass. And afterward, I'd like to just let Mr. Douglass speak. When it is finally ours, this freedom, this liberty, this beautiful and terrible thing, needful to man as air, usable as the earth, when it belongs at last to our children, when it is truly instinct, brain matter, diastole, systole, reflex action, when it is finally won, when it is more than the m gaudy mumbo jumbo of politicians, this man, this Douglas, this former slave, this Negro beaten to his knees, exiled, visioning a world where none is lonely, none hunted, alien. This man, superb in love and logic, this man shall be remembered. Oh, not with statues rhetoric, not with legends and poems and wreaths of bronze alone, but with the lives grown out of his life fleshing his dream of the needful, beautiful thing. Mr. Douglas was born, as I'm sure many of you or most or all of you know, a slave in Talbot County, Maryland, year 1817 or 18, he wasn't sure, and uh, escaped some roughly 18 to 20 years later. There is a, a work that must be shared because it, it just says so much to so many people. And I believe he gave this address 
before a group of friends who were celebrating the 23rd anniversary of West Indies emancipation. He was quite saddened by the fact that his great friend, John Brown, Aswatomi Brown, could not be with him. But he remembered to think and to say that John Brown, Aswatomi Brown, will trouble them more than ever when they've nailed his coffin down. Let me give you a word of the philosophy of reform. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of earnest struggle. The conflict has been exciting, agitating, all absorbing, and for the time being, putting all other tumults to silence. It must do this, or it does nothing. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Now this struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Find out just what people will quietly submit to, and you have found out the exact amount of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. In the light of these ideas, Negroes will be hunted at the north and held and flogged at the south so long as they submit to these devilish outrages and make no resistance, either moral or physical. Men may not get all they pay for in this world, but they must certainly pay for all they get. If we ever get free from all of the oppressions and wrongs heaped upon us, we must pay for their removal. We must do this by labor, by suffering, by sacrifice, and if needs be, by our lives and the lives of others. Thank you. At this point in our program, I am instructed here to call on Dave Gordon. Dave Gordon, co-chair of the dinner committee for remarks regarding the Southern California Library. Before I begin, A gentleman wearing a white hat has just passed by me to remind me, merely by so doing, that is to say, by passing by, that he may be coming around to your table with a petition. Feel free to make a donation then, and thank you. Now I'll begin at the beginning of this message. Chief Gates' latest postponement of his retirement date and lack of reaction from city council or media shows again 
the need for police accountability. The campaign for electing civilian police uh, on a police review board now has over 100,000 signatures, but it has just three weeks left to finish this drive. The campaign needs two kinds of help. If you're in Los Angeles City, or you, if you are a Los Angeles City resident, circulating a petition to friends, co-workers, etc., and return by March 1st. If you don't live in Los Angeles, your contribution will follow them uh, to higher door. Petition circulators for final push, the man in the white hat mainly, will be coming to your table. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to get your attention and call on Jeff Horton. <laughs> Jeff Horton, as you know, is a member of the Los Angeles Board of Education, a close colleague of our honoree on the inter integration project and successor to her seat on the Los Angeles Board of Education. He's got to be a hell of a man. <laughs> yes, thank you and good evening. Um, I'm sure you haven't forgotten that it was at this point that Senator Diane Watson was going to make her presentation and that pre presentation certainly is, is ringing resonantly in my ear now as she wins her way into San Francisco. Um, but she did make uh, a pact with a gentleman before leaving. And that gentleman has agreed that he will come up and make that presentation. I call him and he calls himself Oh, come on, Ed. <laughs> I was scratched. No, oh, but you've been rewritten now. God almighty, it is. Uh, <laughs> I made a few notes. You. <laughs> Forgive me, I, I was taken totally unawares, as well as unprepared. Oh, you're there. Oh, that's good. Still there. Uh, because the piece de resistance is yet to come. Not to slight you, Alexander. Um, I uh, worked with this fellow who was twice as tall as me in, yeah, I bet you didn't know he was this old. I worked with him in 1955 and I saw him do a monumental Titanic Oedipus and I was the leader of the chorus and he truly made me feel like a Corrine. What does that mean? Well, I meant, you know, I, 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 felt, I felt like a midge compared to you on, on that stage. Because it was a huge stage. 
and he, uh, he was not dwarfed by it, but the rest of us were. Anyway, I'm, I wasn't a bad Corrine either, for those of you laughing on my right. Uh, but the guest of honor tonight, and, and it's, it's great to see that he hasn't lost his zip. The guest of honor tonight is another person that I am awed by. It is a, uh, a person that I've had only fleeting contact with because somewhere a few years ago I became known as a progressive who opened his mouth uh, and most of the time it was by accident. Uh, and I came into contact with Jackie, and somewhat knowing of her, and uh, we were talking about an issue, and I can't even remember what it was. And by this time I was expressing my fear of opening my mouth further, and she demonstrated that in, in the most eloquent manner I've ever been approached with, you, you do what you have to do. And she has done it consistently. Now, we both went to the University of Chicago, but unfortunately... <laughs> we also gave you Milton Friedman. <laughs> and a few others of that ilk. <clears throat> uh, but I dropped out after a year and a half. So I guess enough of the good stuff didn't wear off on me. But it sure as hell wore off on her. Because this is a person who has steadily, consistently registered the most beautiful acts, both verbally and in action, for the progressive way of life. She did it and most notably so, during the decade of depression that we came out of a few years ago, but seems to be extending into the 90s as well. And she is most sorely needed, more sorely needed now than ever, because there are people clamoring from below to be led, and she must use her talents as soon as she can to be that leader. I give you Jackie Goldberg. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. I've had a glorious evening. I think you have too. And at the bottom of my script here it says, it's wrap up time. So. Between earth and sky, thought I heard my Savior cry. You better get a home in that rock, don't you see? 